There it is. Good morning. <laughs> In the uh, words of King Henry VIII to his second wife, I won't keep you long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I never want to get in between folks in their lunch, so uh, it's for too long. It, it really has been a joy to be here with you, to, um, um, to open up Scripture, to be in this setting, um, to be among uh, folks that are working out their faith with fear and trembling as I am. Um, it feels a, a real honor. Uh, John McCarty, you've been a gift to me over these last months, speaking with you on the phone, seeing your ministry from afar and now close up. Um, um, you're a gift to this community and to my life. Um, to the Yeager family, their continued vision for the church has been a blessing to all Methodism. Um, Marvin, as you um, help me remember some of my own story, um, it was in my own breakdown that um, something broke through. And I find that to be true in most of our lives, that most of us um, need to have a breakdown before a breakthrough can come. Um, and part of my breakdown and breakthrough was the fact that I had housed Christianity in my brain and hoped that it would trickle down somewhere and make me okay. Um, it was in the face of watching um, Catholic nuns um, love in a place where love should not be where hope should not be that it broke through in my life and opened me up. It was there uh, I'd learned um, really from the words of Alcoholics Anonymous that we have to act ourselves into a new way of thinking. We can't think ourselves into a new way of acting. And I think that that is a call of the church in this place is that we must act ourselves into new ways of thinking. Um, and uh, um, I think we have a great model of that in Christ. So let's pause for a moment and just uh, uh, pray before this time. Now may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. It was uh, in 1975, my folks had uh, just become Christians. They came out of the Jesus movement. We, um, we um, uh, became members of uh, Suburban United Methodist Church. And uh, for, uh, for my folks, faith was something that you performed. Uh, I saw them perform their faith day in and day out in their lives. Um, my mother um, heard about a halfway house in downtown Dallas. And so um, on Saturdays and every Sunday after church for uh, as many years as I can remember, we went to this place called the House, house of Faith. It was, um, it was a halfway house that took in drug addicts and uh, prostitutes coming off the streets. Um, my, my folks must not have known that I was a little kid because we were just kind of chucked in there with, uh, with them all. <laughs> Uh, and many of these folks started getting baptized. They became Christians. I watched this happening, and uh, I asked my folks if I could get baptized too, and they said yes. Um, my sister uh, sent me a couple pictures uh, about a month or two ago, and in those collection of pictures is a picture of me at my baptism. Uh, I was baptized in a pool um, up near Lake Texoma. And around uh, uh, me in this picture are a bunch of um, recovering heroin addicts and ex-prostitutes. <laughs> I think I'm eight or nine years old. <laughs> and I'm standing around this pool, my hair parted in the middle, looking like Peter Frampton. Um, uh, smiling from ear to ear, knowing that I wanted to be identified with the story of Jesus. I wanted to be identified with this Jesus. I knew that at, even at that time I was being claimed and I was being shaped by the love of God. Even at that age, my heart was open to a power and to a presence that was uh, deeper than what my own brokenness uh, would become in the years following. Over these past couple of months, I've been thinking a lot about baptism, uh, particularly um, in the last couple of days following General Conference my own hand wringing, standing around the hand wringing of others. I think that this may have something to say to us. Because at baptism, really the call of our own lives is to live by a different script. 
do you renounce Satan in all of his works? I was asked as an eight-year-old. Sure, I said. <laughs> Which is really to ask, there is a different narrative that the gospel is creating, and will you give your life to that? Will you become that? Amid all the narrative of consumerism and militarism, of the therapeutic kind of uh, um, world that we live in, will you live counter to those kinds of narratives that want to shape us? And will you live by a narrative of the gospel to be formed by it, to be given to it? Our Christianity has been formed in modernity where there's a promise of assurance and certainty. And our faith, I think, will always lead us to a Kierkegaardian edge where we don't know what to do, we don't know where to go, but we have to lean forward into the arms of a God that calls us to take a leap of faith out of our assurances, out of our certainty, not making strategic moves, making sure at the end we will come out as winners, but giving ourselves to a God that abandons himself to a world that God loves. We have married our prophetic calling as clergy many times to upward mobility and security. And that becomes very problematic in these times. And so as the, over the last season, I've returned to baptism as an anchor and as a resource, realizing that baptism puts, it, puts us somewhere. It takes us somewhere. One of the things I missed out in 1975 was just that, as a kid, that the New Testament call to being baptized means that baptism puts us somewhere. It puts us where Jesus is. Because being immersed in Jesus is to go where Jesus goes. Paul in 1 Corinthians, when he talks about baptism, kind of reaches into the history of Israel and says something really odd about being baptized into Moses. That Israel is being baptized into Moses when they came out of bondage. And what he seems to be saying is that the Israelites go where Moses goes. And it's not always where they want to go. It's not always in the place of security. It's never in the place that has kind of a five-year plan. They're immersed in the destiny of Moses. And they're carried along with him. And so it is with us. We are immersed in Jesus and we go where Jesus goes. So where does that exactly take us? Where does baptism put us? Where does it deposit us? I want to suggest today in just a couple of minutes that um, baptism will always place us in three distinct, distinct neighborhoods. There's a picture of um, Jesus being baptized in the Greek Orthodox tradition. It's represented in this kind of classical icon. Uh, most medieval depictions of Jesus um, have John the Baptist looking like he just stepped out of a VW van, you know. <laughs> his, <laughs> his hair longer than me, kind of tanned. He's kind of looking like he's, uh, um, um, he's a hippie. Jesus in these depictions in medieval kind of art uh, looks more like a northern European who's just laid down his surfboard and he's standing in about an ankle deep of water, right? <laughs> but not for the Greek Orthodox. Our Greek Orthodox brothers and sisters in this icon, Jesus is naked, is stripped naked. His clothes um, are um, being held by uh, uh, angels on one side, John the Baptist on the other side, and he is neck deep in water. And this hand is coming out of heaven, looking like it's about to punch him in deeper into the waters. And underneath him, you see these um, gargoyle-like figures represent the evil of the world, these shadowy figures that are supposed to represent the river gods, this primordial chaos, these shadowy figures that represent all the turmoil, all the hostility, all the disorder, all the violence in the world. Karl Barth calls this the dashnita of the world, that which is nothing, the return to chaos. 
The presence which extinguishes and abates and stands against the very creative work of God. And these are the waters that Jesus is immersed in. These are the waters that Jesus is plunged into. The baptism of Jesus is understood as a descent into the chaos, into a world of unregulated reality, of despair, of acquiescence to all that would undo creation, and he's up to his neck in it. This is not a God that stands outside, that pulls outside. This is a God that's given to it. It's submerged into it. And it's out of this primordial elemental chaos that God brings forth creation. And just as the spirit comes down brooding over the chaos in Genesis 1 and brings it out a a world, so Jesus descends into the chaos of this world. The spirit comes down upon him. And equips him to bring out of the world a new creation. So if we were to ask where baptism deposits us, where does it take us, what neighborhood and what location does baptism put us in, well, I think we'll find that the first neighborhood is the neighborhood of chaos. Baptism brings us near to the chaos. In a sense, to be baptized is to, be, is to go where Jesus goes, into the depth of human condition. It means that individuals and as a community, we have to be in touch with our own chaotic need, our own inability to put our own lives in order, to be in touch with our own suffering, our own chaos. We do the world no service. When we show up at church and we place masks over our lives and you ask me, how you doing? And I say, fine. And underneath all that fineness, there is things I don't know what to do with chaos that creeps up at me in the middle of the night. We do no service to the world when we hide our vulnerability, when we hide our brokenness, because it always comes out sideways. It always comes out as a type of meanness that we're clutching against the world with, or we disappear. So the baptism of Jesus, our own baptism, will always deposit us us into the neighborhood of chaos. It's not an attempt to manicure our lives in front of each other, but to stand in front of each other in the reality that if the life-giving rivers of living water are going to flow out of us, it's going to be an act of God in our midst. To live baptismally means that our own inner life must not become afraid of looking at our own chaos. To pretend that our own inner life is more tidy than it really is. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this, that in our confessions many times what happens is that we confess to a um, holy God In our prayer closets, we go into our prayer closets and we confess all manners of evilness to a holy God. He says, why is it so difficult then to confess our sins to one another? He said, because in confessing our sins to one another, that's where the two or three are gathered in our midst. And that the two or three actually represents the very presence of God. So many times in our prayer closets, it's an act of really denying God, but it's in our confession with one another and our vulnerability with each other that the very presence of God comes to liberate us. Bonhoeffer says that's why when a real sinner shows up in church, we're all really shocked. (laughs) So our baptism is a call to do our own work to increase the messiness factor around churches. To not have it all together. A friend of mine um, is a pastor and he um, had a woman come to his church one time who was a recovering addict. They'd been coming for two or three months. She made her way down to the front after one of his sermons. And she said, I've been coming for a while and I really like this church. People are really, really kind to me. We love the children's ministry. I'm a single mom, and um, we're kind of putting our lives back together. I've been in recovery for a while. I love it here. 
But I'm just wondering where people went to before they got here because I'm not ready for all of this. <laughs> um, I kind of need to know where people got to that got clean and got all put together before they got here because that's where I need to go. I want to be here. I just am not here yet. So some of the call of baptism is not to up our standards. It's to lower our standards. It's at least to lower our standards to be as low as Jesus had them. And to not put on an air, but to live vulnerably, to live nakedly before each other. Because one thing that baptism does not do is to put us in charge of our own circumstances. It is not to create a supernatural force field. We're plunged down deep with God into the depths of our own selves, into the depths of God's world, to understand the rawness and pain and despair into which the Spirit of God descends to, brings forgiveness and renewal. I think I mentioned uh, on Sunday that I drank deeply as a child um, of this God that moves us left to right and up, that Christianity is this unbroken movement left to right and up, a theology of ascent. But again, in his baptism and the death and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus points us towards a theology of descent, of moving downward, descending. We've often understood baptism as the position of status that marks us off from others. And I think that that in the end is wrongheadedness. And here's the paradox, because obviously from the very beginning, baptism has a function and has functioned as a marker of Christian identity and markers of identity of identity mark people off, don't they? But here it seems that we have a marker of identity which is meant to give us precisely that identity which is not to be afraid of identification with any other human circumstance. It is not to put us a, a behind a rope or behind a wall. It is to allow us to identify with any, and o- any other human circumstance. Baptism, if it's an entry and identity with Jesus, who is identified with God entering chaos. It is an entry into the most profound solidarity with human experiences that we could ever imagine. It is not being a part of a holy club distinguished by its purity and absolute integrity. And I think it's taken a long time for the church to realize that the body of Christ is a wounded body. The body has been breached and is wounded. And to live in the body of Christ is not to live in isolation. To be holy is to be in the neighborhood of Jesus and therefore also to be in the neighborhood of whomever Jesus is in the neighborhood of. We see in the Gospels the sort of people that Jesus is constantly, habitually in the neighborhood of. And once again, we're back to a proximity, a neighborhood of chaos. And so the second neighborhood that we find ourselves living in as Christians is to be brought into a neighborhood of chaos, is also to be brought into the neighborhood of of our human neighbors, to their needs, to their confusion. The baptism puts us in solidarity with the world. And so there's a sense in which baptism is not only being cleansed from, but in a strange sense, baptism is also means to be contaminated by. In Christ, God lives in a wounded body in the world. He who has made sin on our behalf for our sake. And from only lowering our defenses, opening up the breaches, becoming more vulnerable, comes openness of the spirit. And Jesus became contaminated by baptism to be affected by the needs and the chaos of the world. This was the unyielding mission of Jesus to stand with those that we are tempted to regard as contaminated, to stand in the neighborhoods that make us feel awkward. So baptism is to be up to our necks in it, to be in touch with our own chaos, our own need, our own doubt, our own addictive and maladjusted tendencies, living in the proximity of chaos, and to understand that the only place, the only place that we are spoken to by love and by the love of God 
is to be summoned by the identity as a child of God in and through the spirit and be standing in the place where Jesus stands. So baptism takes us to risky and dangerous places. The cost of facing our own chaos, the cost of standing in solidarity with others, the cost of our own contamination is the cost of it all. There was a couple in um, my church at Mercy Street that we baptized named Paul and Peggy Hinnick. And um, over the years, they um, rooted into our community. They were amazing folks. There was a woman um, named Jessica that we baptized her and her child. Jessica was uh, part of the Santa Maria Hostel, this women's shelter that was in uh, our neighborhood. And um, she was a a recovering addict, and um, Santa Maria was kind of known as the last stop for women in recovery. And uh, we baptized her and um, her little son named Jacob. And about a year um, later, uh, Jessica went back out, and um, her addiction took the better part of of her. The court stepped in and gave her... um, Uh, a 50-year prison sentence because of some other things that had gone on. So this little boy, Jacob, was put into uh, CPS. It was removed and um, was placed into custody. Paul and Peggy Hinnick um, came to me and um, said uh, to me one day, um, Matt, we baptized uh, Jessica and um, Jacob, didn't we? I said, yeah. Yeah. Um, to be baptized, we said that we'd stand with them and they'd be family to us, right? And I said, yeah. <laughs> well, we're wondering um, what that means. And I, I kind of figured where this was going and I couldn't stop it. <laughs> they said, we put our hands on Jacob and we said, you're ours. We claim you as our church and as our family. And it seems that uh, CPS has him and that he should be a part of our family. So we're going to go ask CPS if we can um, claim Jacob and bring him back into our family. Baptism for me at that point had been about a marker, had been about something, had been about identification. It was not about being contaminated. It was not about standing with a little boy that was taken from his mother, put in CPS, And so this plumber and this part-time school teacher, they um, went to the judge and they made their case and they took all the certification they needed to. And they picked picked, um, Jacob up from CPS and they brought him back into their home and back into our community and to our church. And Jacob grew up among us and grew up around us and was one of those burning bushes of a boy that we could not turn aside from, we could not turn away from, because looking at him, we were all contaminated into the ministry of Jesus. How far does the grace of God go? How far does it go? How willing are we to go to the depths of which God takes us, which God goes, God loves his own world? I didn't learn this from a book. I learned this from Paul and Peggy Hinnick. And in the first chapter of John's gospel, we read in the prologue that the word was with God. And that the only begotten was literally in the bosom of God. Surely that's meant to understand that the word of God is, as it's sometimes translated, next to the Father's heart. Jesus says it like this, where I am, My servants will be also. And so the third um, neighborhood that we're taken into is really next to the Father's heart. We find that in baptism, when we're deposited into the world, contaminated in our baptism, given to the world, standing in solidarity, loving the world that God loves, that we find that when we stand there, we're in the very bosom of God. We're in the very heart of God. And this is both a consoling and deeply challenging vision for me. Because the Jesus who stands next to the heart of God and prays Abba Father himself in Gethsemane 
is defenseless, has nowhere else to go, is utterly surrendered to the will of God. So at the very center of the Christian identity and Christian location is in this place that God gives himself to. Where baptism takes us will always be risky. It will be the cost of facing our own chaos, the chaos of the world. It will deposit us into neighborhoods that we would have never thought we would be in. Neighborhoods my mama told me never to go in. (laughs) And when we stand there, we'll find ourselves in the very bosom of God, the very heart of God, redeeming us, redeeming people next to us, finding new ways forward that we never thought we would find, giving up all that we have, giving up our own um, privilege, our own identities, being found in a place where God makes all things new, where God recreates us all. Our baptism is to place us in those neighborhoods. I think the question of the church is, will we be found there? Will we be found in the bosom of God? Will we be found in neighborhoods where we ourselves will feel contaminated, out of control, vulnerable? Or will we cling to an identity, a security, a safe place? And from that place, try to rule the world. Or will we give it all up? Move into the chaos and find ourselves saved and redeemed, a part of a new community, a new family. May it be so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.